So how do we create molecules that fulfill all the Admetox properties? In general, it's hard, but there are a couple of rules of thumbs, in particular one called Lipinski's rule of five. So the four rules in Lipinski's rule of five is not an oxymoron, um, but this is not because there are five rules, but all these rules are multiples of five. So the first thing Lipinski said, these are merely observations of typical drugs that up until the 1990s or so had been successful. It should, the weight should be below 500 Daltons. So that's another way of saying that the molecular, the weight of one molecule should be less than 500 grams per mole, i.e. 500 units, uh, atomic units. And that means because things that are too large will likely not be able to go through the blood-brain barrier, they might not go through membranes, the solubility might be bad, etc. It's just, this is just a rule of thumb, it's an order of magnitude. In practice, things that are too large just won't work. Two, log p should be less than five. Yeah, that sounds completely taken out of the blue. It is taken out of the blue. So log p, p is really the octanol to water partitioning. Octanol to water And this means that it can't be too hydrophobic. Um, so if it's very, very low, that would mean that the quotient between octanol and water would be very low. And that would mean that all the drug would like, sorry, it can't be too high. Uh, if all the drug would like to go in the octanol, then that would be great. It would be instantly be soluble in fat and everything, but it would not be able to be taken up in the bloodstream, right? And if it's not going to be taken up in the bloodstream, it's never going to reach my brain and then we've lost. So. It can't be too hydrophobic, that's all it says here. Three, there should be less than five H-bond donors. You know what a hydrogen bond donor is, right? But I will write it anyway as an example. And four, there should be less than 10 H-bond acceptors. That would just be an O. Both rule 3 and 4 refer to the fact that if there are too many hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, this small molecule would be very hydrophilic. And if it's very hydrophilic, it's certainly going to be very soluble in the blood, which is good, but then it will not be able to go through, say, the membrane and in particular the blood-brain barrier. And most of the binding sites for these small drugs are also going to be small and hydrophobic. So it can't be too hydrophilic and it can't be too hydrophobic. It has to be just right in between. And it can't be too large either. So now we started to restrict these drugs quite a lot. Um, there is a fifth rule that is not really a real Lipinski rule, but I'll add that in a second. But just to show you an example drug that fulfills these rules. Do you know what this is? This is diazepam. Do you know what diazepam is? Well, you probably haven't heard of it. And that's because mo many of these drugs, they have one chemical name, which is the real, the real scientific name we use for them. But then drug design companies, uh, pharma companies, they want a fancy marketing name. And this marketing name is frequently different in Europe versus the US, partly because they want to be able to protect the name rights. So diazepam that you've never heard of, that is the molecule usually sold under the marketing name Valium. So this is a strong uh, sedative and everything. Um, it is successful. There are not too many side effects, but it's relatively easy to overdose on. So it's, it's certainly not a non-dangerous drug. Diazepam is, I forgot what the exact molecular weight is, but it's relatively small. So it certainly fulfills this one. Uh, it also fulfills log P. Again, I don't remember exactly what it is. The point is that it fulfills it. There is a three hydrogen bond acceptors and not a single hydrogen bond donor, if I recall correctly. So again, we're well within the range of these two limits too. Then there is something else here that's very nice. There is only a single large bond that can rotate here. And I'll add that as the fifth. Occasionally we, we say, this is not really an original Lipinski rule of five, but 
occasionally we say less than five freely rotating bones. So why is it so bad to have freely rotating bonds? Well, that has to do with the free energy in exactly the same way that you learned from protein folding. So if you were to have two molecules, one that is very floppy and flexible, let's say with 10 freely rotating bonds here, what's going to happen to the entropy of that molecule once you force it to actually go into a binding site? That's right. You can have a gigantic reduction in entropy if the molecule was very free out in water. If you have a gigantic reduction in entropy, that means that it's not going to be good for free energy at all. It's likely not going to be an efficient binder. But drugs with lots of these aromatic rings, lots of things that are tied up here so it can't really rotate that much, it's already restricted out in water. So when you're moving this molecule from the water to the binding site, there is not a gigantic reduction in entropy. And that means that we will likely get a free, better free energy of binding. The other less noble part is that the more freely rotating bonds there are, the harder it is for us to predict what the exact shape of it is. So it's simply it's easier to work with molecules that are not as flexible. But that wasn't really Lipinski's rule. Again, these are purely phenomenological. These are things that usually make, used to make for good drugs. So when, how frequently is it that we get a new drug like this? It doesn't happen anymore. The problem is that at least when I looked at this a few years ago, we hadn't had a new drug fulfilling all the Lipinski's rules of five since 1996. So this classical traditional drug design doesn't really work anymore. There are either side effects or for whatever reason they never make it to the market. So it's harder, much harder to design drugs than we think. A whole lot, bunch of these traditional drugs, say aspirin, um, they would likely not uh, be approved on the market if they appear today because there are side effects that 50 or 100 years ago we consider them acceptable. By today's standards, they're not acceptable anymore. And this is why drug design is so expensive. Most drugs tend to fail. There are very few that make it all the way. And the further along you are, the riskier things get because you've invested so much money.